I'm working out of the Akron area, primarily in the schools. I do a lot of the evaluations, work with our wonderful COTAs, and I get to work at a ton of different schools. So I've been able to see assistive technology in that area. Plus, this has just been a particular area of interest to me, so I've done a lot of extra continuing ed things like that. So today we're going to look at more of that overview type activities of what some of the different levels of assistive technologies, types of assistance you can support students in the classroom with, and some of the different academic areas we can support. We'll look at different tools and programs that you can use to support students with their reading and writing. We'll talk about some of those different tools, how they would look and how you could implement them in the classroom. We'll look a little bit at the assessment process, as well as how to document all of this information into the IEP. So first, it is important to kind of look at who might assistive technology be a good option for. Some of the things we often hear teachers or students tell us is that a student might be telling them that it's too hard to read the letters or the print is too small, especially when they're trying to read something from the board or on the computer, it's too hard to read the small print. Sometimes students will tell us they aren't able to hear everything that's being said, or maybe a student needs text read to him in order to complete the assignment. This is especially good for kids who have trouble with decoding, but are good with the comprehension piece. So these are the students that if you read them a passage, they understand all of it, but if you have them read it, they miss a lot of those important pieces. This can also be really helpful to look at students when their handwriting is a concern, when it's so illegible that it's hard for their teachers or the student themselves to decipher what they were writing, or if their writing is just so slow or exhausting that it's counterproductive to be able to write in class. So Assistive technology is supported under IDEA or the Individuals with Disability Act, and that's what helps bring it into the schools and can be part of a student's IEP. They look at assistive technology in two ways, as both a device and a service. The device is what most of us think of as assistive technology. So this would be that item, piece of equipment, a product system such as software, which could either be off the shelf or made by a customizable type thing where the therapist, the student, or the family makes it themselves. And the purpose of that device is to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of a child with a disability. And then the service is the piece that many of us do as therapists. This is that service that helps the student to be able to use that device. So it can work with helping to select the device, helping to acquire it, and use it in the classroom, their home, or in the community. So looking at assistive technology, one of the first ways to classify it is by the level of technology. So with this, you can look at something that is low technology, moderate or mid technology, or high technology. Low technology are those things that we typically have in most classrooms all the time. Things like a pencil grip, a graphic organizer, paper overlay, even something as simple as I know a lot of teachers will put a piece of paper over like a worksheet of math problems so the student doesn't see as many problems at the same time. Even that piece of paper would be considered assistive technology. These types of assistive technology sometimes are clearly defined in an IEP for the student or some of these are just things that are built into the classroom that all students have access to. The next one is that moderate or mid-level technology. These are things that usually have some type of batteries or an electronic component. Some are more easily accessible than others. Calculator, that's in most classrooms. However, we will specify when a student does need a calculator, uh, especially for testing accommodations. Other things that could fall in this category are audio recorders, um, a reading pen, 
or things like an alpha smart um, if any of you are unfamiliar with alpha smart it is a very simple word processing computer where basically it just has the keyboard and a really thin line of text so that they can type instead of write but it's much simpler than a computer would be and then for high tech, these are the things that most people truly think of as assistive technology, such as that dictation software, um, an augmentative communication device, a power wheelchair, an eye gaze system to be able to access the computer, things like that. So while the high tech are what most people think of as assistive technology, all three categories can be defined that way. And then the other way you can define assistive technology is by its purpose. So the Wisconsin Assistive Technology Initiative, also called WADI, created 14 categories to describe assistive technology. And this is an amazing website. If you look up any questions about assistive technology, if you look up the Wisconsin Assistive Technology Initiative. They have so many great resources in addition to just their classification. They're a great resource if you want to learn more about this area. So we won't talk about all 14 today. The four areas we'll talk about today are computer access, the motor aspects of writing, composition of written material, and reading. So before we start looking into the specific categories, does anybody have any questions, anything they'd like me to go into more detail in? Okay, great. So the first area we'll look at is computer access. So these are tools that will help a student to use or control the computer. So we'll look more in depth on each one of these, but we'll look at some keyboard modifications adaptive keyboards, adapted mouses or trackpads, typing aids, and voice control. So with keyboard modifications, you can either have modifications that are already built into the keyboard, or you can have ones that are using a separate or an adapted keyboard. The first ones we'll look at is those modifications that are built into every keyboard. So pretty much every computer, Mac, um, Windows, or Chromebooks will have these somewhere in their menu. So the first one is sticky keys. This allows a student to press a modifier key in sequence rather than holding both keys at a time. So a good example of this is when you need to press um, shift and the letter to capitalize it. Some students have a hard time getting their fingers on both letters, holding them for the same time, and just that whole motor planning piece. So with this, you would be able to first press shift, then take your finger off of the key, then press the letter to capitalize it. So that can be a helpful way to get those function keys working better for students. The next one is slow or filter keys. This adjusts the amount of time between when a key is pressed and when it is activated. So this is particularly helpful for those students who have a hard time getting their finger off of the key. So if you think of a student who has a hard time with that motor control piece where they would put their finger on the keyboard and it takes them a while to get their finger back off that key, they would have typed that letter 15 times before they got their finger off. So with this, you can slow that down so that maybe when they press the letter, it takes a two second delay before it presses the, second, the letter again. So that can be really helpful for students who have a hard time getting their fingers off the keys, as well as for students who tend to just hit a lot of keys really quickly to get that reaction. With this, it slows it down so they have to more purposefully touch and release each key. Then the last one here is typing feedback or toggle keys. So this will create some type of an audio feedback while you're typing. Most of us are really familiar with this on iPhones or iPads where it makes that little clicking noise, but you can also modify it to echo the letter that is being typed or um, your modifier keys or your function keys or just change the sound up if you don't like the clicking. It could be a little ding type sound, any of those. And on a 
um, Mac, these are all found under the accessibility menu and on a Windows um, computer, they're under the ease of access menu. So next thing we can look at is adaptive keyboards. These are a keyboard that you would change out and use instead of whatever is built in with the computer. Especially for a desktop model, this is pretty, it's pretty easy to change the keyboards in and out. So for adaptive keyboards, you can have ones that are designed specially for use with one hand. So that's this picture up here um, with kind of the small round piece. Um, and then that one specifically designed for one hand or the one next to it on the left with the white keys and the black background. That is a one handed keyboard, but it's got a lot more options on it versus having to press multiple keys to get everything done. Next one is the Dvorak keyboard, which is this one down here in white. It is the same size and everything as a standard keyboard, but the keys are in different order. Interesting piece of trivia, the standard um, keyboard layout we have, which is sometimes called the QWERTY keyboard, is actually not the most efficient way of typing. Um, the key placement was used back when people were using typewriters and people were typing so fast that the keys didn't have enough time to hit and come back. So they put them in this order that it helped slow down typing and put the keys in a different order so that the keys were less likely to bump into each other and could be typed more effectively on a typewriter. Random piece of trivia. So, and that's just stuck around. Through research, they found that the key placement on the Dvorak keyboard is a little more efficient for a lot of people, but you would have to learn a new style of keyboarding with the letters in a different placement. And then on-screen keyboards um, are accessible on, I would say, pretty much every computer. That's again through the accessibility menu. And with this, a keyboard would pop up on your screen, very similar to how it looks on an iPad. And then you could press each letter using your mouse. So it would be a mouse click to do each letter. It's not the quickest way of typing, but for someone who's only able to use a mouse, it's a great option. And then IntelliKeys is a pretty fancy keyboard system. It is a separate keyboard that's kind of similar to a touch screen. It's got a membrane pad and then you put a, um, they almost look like placemats, but there's like a mat that goes over them and you can modify them however you want. So it can have just a few letters on it. It can be a different color. You can change the size. You can even make the keys have certain words on them. So if the student isn't ready to type letters, they could practice typing words, things like that. So, and then that's just a separate system you buy and then you have to buy or customize all the different mats that go in. Then as far as adapted mouses, you can see um, two different kinds down here. The yellow one would be an adapted trackball mouse. There's also ones that look like joysticks. If you can kind of think of old school computer gaming joysticks, those can be easier for some people to grasp and then you would click a button very similar to the old school gaming devices. Or switch access, a lot of people have seen when students are working on that kind of cause and effect type thing or also often used with augmentative assistive communication. So with the switch, that's just one press with the hand. You can also have switches placed anywhere on the body. I've used um, head switches, elbow switches, toe switches, basically anywhere the student has voluntary movement, you can place the switch. And then for typing aids, some people don't have any of that voluntary movement, um, places where they can use their fingers, or um, they just don't have that control, but they want to be able to type faster. So you can use a typing stylus. This is a picture of one with two styluses, one for each hand. People can actually type quite quickly with those. Or sometimes you'll see people with spinal cord injuries using the mouth sticks. And again, people can type amazingly fast with those. So those are just some other ways to use the keyboard keyboards. Then the last way is through voice control. This would be allowing a student to use the computer only with their voice. 
Now, currently, both Mac and Windows have these as a built-in accessibility feature, um, voice control on the Mac or speech recognition on Windows. You can use this as a purchase software. Dragon Naturally Speaking is the one that's been around the longest. And I would say that it's probably the best at truly hearing your words. So I've found that students with articulation difficulties are often more successful with Dragon Naturally Speaking, but as that's gotten better on all computers, it's less of an issue than it needed to be, than it used to be. Um, then there's also ones for specialty programs like TOTSI is a software that's designed specifically for computer gaming and it understands those commands really well so that a student could interact with an online gaming like World of Warcraft with peers, friends online. And then you can also have voice control that works just for internet navigation. Either of these other ones, voice control or speech recognition can work for the internet, but if you're using Chrome or a Chromebook, you can also use um, Google Chrome voice control. And just to mention, this is not the same as dictation software where it's just typing using your voice. This is full computer access. We will talk about dictation a little bit. So here's a little video demonstrating this. This is using the Mac, the Mac version of speech recognition. And I will tell you, this was 100% with my voice. It took me a little bit to figure it out, but. Open Safari. Google.com. Press return key. Potatoes. Click potatoes and onions. Press return key. Scroll down. Show numbers. Click 31. Scroll down. Show grid. Click 23. Close tab. Close window. So as you can see, you definitely have to know the commands that you need to use for this, but you can access anything on your computer and the grids and the numbers are really helpful so that you can make sure you select the right thing. This can also be used for things like opening a Word document and telling it file open, things like that. So pretty much anything you can do on your computer with a mouse you can do with voice control as long as you know the proper code and sequence to do it in. Jessica, I have a question. Sure. Um, can you um, customize like the controls, like how you were saying, like um, you know, scroll down or press. I mean, can you like what your with what your commands are? Can you um, customize those to the individual? There is some customizable ability. Um, I think it's going to depend on your specific computer. But like on the Mac, it has a whole list of here's all of the ones that the computer already knows. And then you can add in additional commands. You just have to write them out as to exactly what they do. Cool. So it would be possible. I don't think it would be easy, but it's definitely possible. There we go. So the next area we'll look at is those motor aspects of writing. So these are tools that will help a student efficiently and effectively write to share their ideas and knowledge. Some of the things we'll look at is standard typing, so using a word processor or an annotated PDF, word prediction, word completion, and dictation. So for standard typing, this is really pretty easy. This is just allowing students to type rather than handwrite. As we found, a lot of students just never quite get that grasp of handwriting 
to a point that it is legible or efficient. So maybe they can produce legible handwriting, but it takes so long that it's just not effective to do in class. So for these students, we can start with just giving them access to that computer. They can type their assignments within Microsoft Word, Apple Pages, Google Doc, and then just either print them or share them back with their teacher. Another really cool thing you can do is what is an annotated PDF. So basically, this is where you either take a picture or scan a document. This is super helpful with worksheets. So think of like a social studies worksheet where there's those little boxes to fill in the blanks to answer a question. So if the student couldn't handwrite those out, but they wanted to be doing it in the same way as their peers, you could either snap type on the iPad lets you just take a picture of that worksheet or Kami is a Chrome extension where you could scan it in. Then the students could type in those same little boxes. It would look the same as their peers. So they could do a fill in the blank. They could do short answer and it would type it on that digital version of the worksheet and then they could either share it back with their teacher or print it out. So that can be a great tool for a lot of students to do the same work as their peers, just in a different way. And this is an example of snap type. So we took the picture of it. And then in snap type, it's helpful to do a little bit of resizing, but not completely necessary. I just think it looks better. And then you would name the document, whatever you need to, to remember it. And then you see you can just type right in those same spots. And if you type it in the wrong spot, cool thing is you can then shift it over to where it goes. And then you can save it and share it as a PDF through email, or if you have your iPad connected to a printer, then you can print it out. So the next with snap type. Sorry, go ahead. What was that? Sorry. With snap type, you can also do um, voice typing as well mm -hmm. to annotate for you if they're having trouble typing. Yeah, cool. thank you. That's an important thing to note. All of these can build on each other. So yeah, you can add the voice typing or dictation on top of both snap type and Cami. And if you have a separate word prediction program, you can add the word prediction on top of that as well. So, and both SnapType and Kami have a free version to start with. With SnapType, it's free and it has all of the same features, but you can't save very many documents. I think last I checked, it was three at a time. Um, Kami, you can save as many as you want, but you don't have all of the features. And if I remember right, voice to um, voice typing is not available through Kami, but if you have a different voice typing program, you can use that on top of Kami. So it's kind of interesting how you can layer all these different tools. Is Snap Type available on the Chromebook? Um, nope, it's only for iPads, but you could do Kami on the Chromebooks. Um, it's just an but extension for Google Chrome but then you'd have to have a whole nother like dragon or something available to use um, it for voice typing or yeah. could you use Google Chrome else? does have its own version of voice typing that's built in. So you could scan it in through Kami and then you could use the voice typing from Google. Okay. So yeah, the layering is a little, little tricky to get all the pieces together. And then the full version of Kami, which some schools do pay for because they use it as part of their Google Classroom, does have its own voice typing built in. Any other questions about those two? Okay, great. So the next thing is looking at um, word prediction or word completion. So the purpose of this is to allow students to use fewer keystrokes by either predicting the current word or the next word or completing the word that they're typing. So most people are very familiar with word prediction as well as word completion because it's a built-in feature on 
all iPhones and iPads as well as many Android. So this is that thing when you're typing a text message and it's got those little words up above giving you the options of what to type or it's trying to complete the word you're typing, sometimes with bad autocorrect. Now on the computers, there are actually some more robust versions of this that sometimes work a little better, than you, though you will still get some fun errors here. So you can either use the built-in features, um, Read and Write Gold, which is a software program that is most easily accessible as a Chrome extension. There's a free version and a paid version of Read and Write. Some people also call it Google Read and Write. Um, the free version does not have word prediction in. There is a free teacher version that has the, all of the features, um, but the paid version does have a really good word prediction as part of it. And um, co-writer, is very, very similar to Read and Write Gold. It's again, one of those big robust programs that is a paid version. WordQ, again, very similar paid version. And then the on-screen keyboard, which is what you see here in the black, that is a standard accessibility feature that you can pop up and then you would click on the letters or words with your mouse and the on-screen keyboards typically do have a word prediction feature built in. So then word completion is that autocomplete of the word where it's guessing what you're trying to say. It's a built in feature on a lot of word pro word processors, including Google Docs, as well as a built in feature in web browsers. So here's a little video showing the difference between word prediction and word completion. Oh, sorry, I made it stop. So here you can see as it kind of fills in that last little word in gray, depending on the program, you would either hit enter or tab to have it complete what you're saying. The key to this is you have to know what you're saying and know how to spell it. See how it first did comprehension, then completion. A student would have to know the difference between those words to make it finish. But this is super useful. And I found that the more you type in a certain program, it tends to know what you want to type and finishes it for you. So when I'm typing about the same thing, like I'm typing reports in Google Docs, it knows the phrases I use and picks them up. So then this is word prediction, where it gives you a list of possible words. Now, I don't have the sound on on this one, but this is through read and write, and it does give you auditory feedback reading each word to you which is great for students who have those reading difficulties as well as writing difficulties. But as you can see, it definitely is slower, but it's still probably faster for these students than typing each individual word, and it does support spelling. And it's one of those that especially if students are able to guess the first letter of their word using those phonics skills. So I know I want to say dog. It starts with a D. Let's sound it out to be able to confirm that you know how to spell it. I would say most words, it can get it within the first two letters, but every once in a while you'll need to go farther. So like spaghetti took four, word, four letters to get to. So that one can be another great tool. I would say the biggest limitation on word prediction is that so many of the programs that involve word prediction are paid programs. So then the last one looking at the motor aspects of writing is dictation. So these are allowing students to type using their voice, um, often called voice typing or um, speech to text. So it is a you can use the built-in accessibility features, voice control, speech recognition, like we'd used to control a computer earlier. Those also work for voice typing. 
On the iPad, it's built in and it's called dictation. And then on Google Chrome, there is also a built-in feature and it's called voice typing. It's really easy to access on Google Docs. It's just under the tools menu. And then you can also use purchase software as we talked about Dragon Naturally Speaking does the computer control as well as voice typing. And then both Read and Write and CoWriter do have a dictation tool as part of their software. So here's an example of that. I can type by talking. Full stop. New paragraph. The monkey lives in the trees and likes to eat bananas, full stop. Bananas are yellow, full stop. New paragraph. In the summer, I like to play outside, comma, ride my bike and read books, full stop. So, and then this is another feature that a lot of students like. That would be the dictation. This is the opposite of dictation, so speech to text, but it's nice to be able to read back what you're writing. The monkey lives in the trees and likes to eat bananas. Bananas are yellow. In the summer, I like to play outside, ride my bike, and read books. So, dictation can be a great tool, and microphones have gotten so much more sensitive. If you noticed, none of my words on there were mistyped or misspelled. This can be a concern with students with articulation difficulties. However, it has gotten a lot better. So as long as it's not a severe difficulty, there is a good chance most students could be able to use this to some extent. Now with those students with the more severe articulation difficulties, that's where you would need to step up to a program like Dragon Naturally Speaking, where you actually train the program to understand your words. So like there's this whole activity as part of Dragon Naturally Speaking, where you go in and it tells you to say a certain sentence a bunch of different times and it understands exactly how you say those words. And then over time it builds and gets better and better. So then the next area we'll look at is composing written material. So these are those things that would help students organize their ideas to express them in a way that is meaningful to others. So these can be graphic organizers as well as those proofreading tools such as grammar checkers, spelling checkers, or dictionary thesaurus. So for a graphic organizer, these allow students to visually organize their thoughts to help them plan their writing. Many students use pen and paper versions of graphic organizers every day in class. But there are also a lot of online organizers that are really fun because you can make them really fancy like this, add in pictures, you can add in links, things like that. Some of the online graphic organizers that people have recommended include MindMeister, um, Mindomo, Poplet, Storyboard That, and Connected Mind. They all just have a little different way they set it up, so that would more be a student personal preference as well as trying to figure out what part of the graphic organizer tools are they needing. So then the other thing is those proofreading software. Most of us are really familiar with this spell check, that built-in spell checker is so helpful for everyone. I don't think I could type without spell checker. Then there are some int other interesting spell checkers. One great one is called Got It, spelled G-H-O-T-I-T. This one is designed for students who spell phonetically. So if you've typed with a student who spells phonetically, you might have noticed that they often can't get the word close enough for spell checker to correct it because their phonetic spelling is so far off from how the English language would spell it. But looking at the phonetics, you go, oh, I know what you meant. So got it is specially designed to be able to catch those words. And then for grammar, Grammarly is a popular one that checks those grammar pieces, as well as there's also the built-in grammar checkers on word processors, the little squiggly blue lines. And then another really cool grammar checker is called Ginger. And this one can be used either as a software program or a Chrome extension. 
And what's cool about this one is it one checks your contextual spelling. So if you see up here, this little blue um, box is Grammarly and what are not Grammarly, Ginger and what all they check. So it would think find things like I ate hamburgers for dinner, not the number. It would correct it to the word. It also checks things like articles, verb tenses, split words. It does do spelling as well. And then articles and context as well as verb tense. So that can be really helpful for students who have difficulty with those grammar rules and need just a more in-depth check of their grammar. And then the dictionary thesauruses, there's a lot of free ones um, that can be popped up just like Google Dictionary, or there are also ones that can be built into a program that you would have access to like as an extension. Some of the cool things are you can do a picture dictionary like this picture dictionary is here from Google or uh, from Read and Write Gold, or this one that pops up and reads it to you is from Google Dictionary. That can be really helpful for some students who just don't know all of the words they're looking for. So, and then the last area we'll look at supporting is reading. So these are tools that help students read and understand written work. So some things we'll look at are screen readers, audiobooks, comprehension support, and visual supports. So screen readers are one of those that I already demoed a little bit, but these are used to read text aloud from the screen. You can use them as a built-in accessibility feature, voiceover or speech are what they would be called on a Mac, narrator on Windows or Chromevox on Google Chrome machines. You can also use purchase software, or Chrome extensions, um, Read and Write Gold has it. Snap and Read is the reading version of CoWriter, or Claro Read is another one. And then optical character recognition is kind of one of those obnoxious things with um, screen readers. So depending on how the whatever text was put onto the screen is how easy it is to read. So if it was just typed in letter for letter, the computer understands it. However, a lot of things are put into the computer as a picture. So some articles, um, instead of uh, typing each individual in, somebody took a picture of it, and the computer needs to be able to convert that picture that just shows everything together into each individual character. So that's why it's called optical character recognition. So it's a program that lets the computer recognize each individual letter of something that wasn't typed in one letter at a time. So that's just one of those obnoxious pieces. If your screen reader is not working, you probably need to convert it with an optical character through optical character recognition. So some of the programs that do that are Snapverter does that, Snap and Read has optical character recognition built in, and so does Kami. So. So here's just an example of a screen reader reading a website. And this one's Clara Read. 64 known monkey species. Monkeys can be divided into two groups, old world monkeys that live in Africa and Asia and new world monkeys that live in South America. A baboon is an example of an old world monkey while a marmoset is an example of a new world monkey. Apes are not monkeys. Some monkeys live on the ground, while others live in trees. Different monkey species eat a variety of foods, such as fruit, insects, flowers, leaves, and reptiles. Most monkeys have tails. So as you notice with that, it's pretty accurate, but you will get some issues with like the live and live, things like that. And it is a little robotic, which is hard for some students, but for a lot of students, it's better than nothing. Now, some of the more robust programs like Read and Write or Snap to Read let you change the speed that it's written as well as the voices. So if you want an English woman or an Australian man talking to you, you can have all that happen. 
So the next one is audiobooks. These are super popular in school these days. These are just resources that allow students to listen to published books. Some of the resources that you'll easily find for these, Epic, Audible, Overdrive, Learning Ally, Downpour, Library Vox, Bookshare, and Raz Kids. Many of your schools already pay for subscriptions to these, and it's just great to make sure that kids have access to them. So here's an example of one of my daughter's favorite books. This is from Epic, um, but showing how it would work with a picture book. Brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? I see a red bird looking at me. And it's nice, a lot of them have that highlight feature where it highlights which word is being said. And in cool things like that was Gwyneth Paltrow reading to us. So you can have fancy people read to you as well as most of them are read by a human reader, which is a lot easier to listen to than that mechanical voice. And then for comprehension support, these are tools that allow students to receive their reading material in a different way. So some of these can be things like picture supports, which would make a symbol or a picture sentence. So like this one here talking about um, the World War II in Europe, so it has trenches were dug from the English Channel. There are programs that will build these for you. Honestly, most people make them themselves, either using board maker, symbol sticks, things like that. But that can be a great tool, especially if students are learning how to read and need that extra picture support. Vocabulary simplification is really cool. This you can take any article off of the internet and simplify the words. Now, it only simplifies what they think is difficult, but you can set the reading level on some of them that I want you to s simplify any words over an eighth grade reading level or over a third grade reading level. Um, Snap to Read has this as well as Rewordify. And so an example of this would be here, they had the earth was an incandescent globe versus they changed it to the earth was a glowing globe. So it'll go through and change any of those words that think are more difficult to read and simplify them to vocabulary your student might know better. And then the dictionary we had seen before, but here's an, it's also helpful in reading as well as writing where it can give you that definition as well as often the picture support as well. So then the other thing we can look at is visual supports. So this changes the look of the visual information on the computer screen. So you can, on a lot of programs, you can change the font, the color, the style. Two really cool versions of this are Google Chrome extensions. One is called Open Dyslexic, and a group got together and developed a font specially for students with dyslexia. Um, that's this font right up here. You can kind of see how each letter is a little more weighted towards the bottom. And it also writes the letters in a way that makes it harder to reverse letters. So a B and a D look more significantly different in this text than they would in typical text. And a lot of people with dyslexia have found this to be really helpful in reading. And then another cool one here is Beeline Reader, which changes the color to help your eye visually track. So as you can see, this one starts as red, then fades to black, and then to blue, so it helps your eyes track across the screen. And there are actually a bunch of different color choices that you can track from light to dark, color to color, whatever's most pleasing to your eye and makes it easier for you to read. Um, then there's simplification tools. Mercury Reader is a great free one, where if you've read um, like a newspaper article online, you know how there's pictures and 8 million ads and everything popping up and flashing. That can be really distracting, well, A, for most of us, but especially for our students who have a hard time reading. So that takes all of that extraneous information and makes it disappear. So it's just the te black text on a black background or on a white background, or you can reverse it, black background, white text. So it just really simplifies what you're reading. Then you can also do color overlays, which changes the background color. Or this example here is a tracking overlay where the background would be kind of that teal color and the sentence you're reading is highlighted in yellow and you can track that down the page. 
Claro Read has a good free one, and then Read and Write and Snap and Read have that as well. So that's all of the tools I have to discuss today. Does anybody have any questions about any of the tools before we get into the assessment and the IEP part? Okay. So for assistive technology assessment, this is an assessment that's designed to identify the technology options that will accommodate students with disabilities. All of these options should increase, improve, or maintain a student's functioning in their educational, vocational, or community environment. A really great framework that was developed to help us in this process is called the SET framework. This is available free online. It's in the resources page. But this is a great way if you're working on an assessment as part of an IEP to help guide your thinking. So it starts with what are the student's strengths, performance, and weakness, and looking at each individual area that might be a concern at school. So reading, writing, math, communication, learning, studying, vision and hearing, or those activities of daily living. Then when we figure out what those challenges are, we look at the learning environment. How is their classroom arranged? Or right now, are they learning online? Are they learning in person? What materials are used? How is instruction given? All of those important things. Then we look at the task. Um, what is this class doing? And what would the students be expected to be doing? And then after that, we start looking at those tools, which assistive technology tools might help your student to be more successful in the classroom. So in the assessment process, first thing the team needs to do is decide what areas or tasks we need to target. What do we need to assess? Then we need to evaluate the student's current ability to complete the task without the assistive technology. So this could be if you want supports for reading, maybe reading fluency, you would need to do a reading fluency assessment to see where they are without those supports. Or if you want to use a technology to support to take handwriting out of the equation, well, how long does it take them to do it while writing? Things like that. Then you would look at their needs and abilities related to that sp specific task. Um, then look at what features they would need and match your tools to it. Narrow down what tool to try. So like you find out they need word prediction. There's like 15 different programs that use word prediction. So you would narrow down which tools you want to try and select them. Conduct those trials and take the data and then select which tool they'll use. And then one of the most important parts of this is to progress monitor to ensure that it is still effective and remains appropriate. I think that's a step that a lot of people miss is they forget to make sure that it that tools continuing to work as the needs change. So this is really important because according to IDEA, it does need to be reviewed at every single IEP. So um that's one of those in ohio it's section number two on our iep where it says in the consideration of special factors is assistive technology needed you would have three possible decisions to answer that question you'd find assistive technology is not needed you did the you did a brief assessment we know we don't need it option two is it's needed the team knows how when where we got a plan, no problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Or <coughs> um, three is that assistive technology is needed, but the team needs more information before making the decision as regards to the type, frequency, and or location that the student is using it. So some helpful questions that you can consider in deciding whether a student needs assistive technology is what are we expecting the student to do in their educational program that they currently can't do? And would assistive technology provide a solution for that? And making sure that does the student need this to meaningfully participate in the general education curriculum? So then once we've decided we need it, it does need to be documented in the IEP. And it can be documented in multiple ways depending on what the student's need are, needs are. 
It should be documented in the area of consideration of special factors. Saying, does the student need assistive technology? Um, it can, sorry, I made that go back. Um, it can be documented in the present levels of academic achievement or functional performance, the goals and objectives, accommodations, or specially designed services. So under the consideration of special factors, this is where you would document yes or no, does the student need assistive technology? If yes and no additional information is needed, you would just document the type of tool and that the what the student is currently using along with the frequency and location. So this could be student requires use of a talking calculator for all math activities that require calculation. Or if you know they need it, but you don't know what yet, you would say the student does need assistive technology and an assessment will be conducted. So then in the present levels of academic achievement and functional performance, somewhere in there, it needs to state what the student is currently using, any data or evidence you have talking about why this technology is being used and when it'll be being used. And if it's no longer needed, it's important to document that the student's no longer needing it and here's why. And then in the goals or objectives benchmarks area, it is important to remember that assistive technology should not be a standalone goal. You should never have a goal. Student will use word prediction for the fact of using word prediction. That's not functional. It needs to be supporting a student in meeting an academic or functional goal. So for example, a student will write a paragraph with at least three details using speech to text technology or a student will ask respond to a question using a picture communication um, system to respond with no more than one verbal prompt. So it does need to be part of that functional goal. And then in the accommodations piece, this is where you would list it as what type of tools being used along with the location and frequency. I know in Ohio, we do have a special section just for assistive technology under accommodations. And with this, it's better to use the type of technology rather than the specific brand names. So say the student needs word prediction software rather than student needs read and write gold. So that as programs change, you can find what best meets the student. And then in services, it can be listed in several sections. It can be under specially designed instructions, related services, that assistive technology section or support for school personnel, depending on where it makes the most sense. So for a student learning to use um, an augmentative communication system, that makes the most sense to be focused with direct speech and language. Or something like ongoing training to staff and family member, that could probably go under support for school personnel, things like that. It's just wherever it feels the most appropriate. And then with after that, it's just kind of making sure whatever makes the most sense to get it in the IEP, it just needs to be in there. So that is the conclusion of my presentation today. Does anybody have any questions, anything they'd like to share, talk about more, anything that you know has worked really well, things like that? Hi, this is December um, with the NorCal uh, Office of TES. Thank you so much for all this great information, Jessica. I really, really learned a lot. Is there going to be a way for us to access this information for review later on? I know it's being recorded, but um, I don't know if Julie, you'll be able to answer that. I don't know who that asked that question. <laughs> I'm actually not positive either, um, but I can um, find out. Um, so when you uh, put your information into the um, the PD questionnaire. Um, we'll have a note of who has attended. So if we are able to do that, we can email it out. Okay, thank okay. you so much. I think that would be really helpful because I did also give a resource page of things like IDEA, SET Framework, the Wisconsin Technology. Um, this one here, Assistive Technology Internet Modules is some great short free professional development classes to learn more about assistive technology, as well as some of the different programs I talked about. So if we awesome. could get that, at least the resources page and things like that, that would be, I think, really helpful. 
Sounds good. Thank you. Um, Jessica, this is Nania in the Columbus area. Uh, this was a wonderful presentation and I loved all of the, the videos demonstrating yeah. all the assistive tech. Um, I just had a question about when we're stating a child's assistive tech needs in an IEP, especially if those needs are a little bit more, like some of the more moderate or um, kind of more intensive needs, do you recommend that those recommendations almost always come from an OT or do you feel confident that other team members like an IS could make some of those recommendations? I think it depends who has the most knowledge about this because I would say whoever has the most knowledge of working with the student and with the tools, as an OT, in school, I learned a little bit about this, but I wouldn't say a ton. Most of this has been professional development because it has been an area of interest to me. And I know some um, intervention specialists, the same thing. I've been talking to Mandy Cotting about this, and she said this was an area of interest of hers, and she has a lot of background on it. So in that case, I think Mandy would have great resources of being able to do that. So I think that's really working within your team to see who has the most knowledge that's almost one of those that I think would be helpful for more school districts to have more resources with that. One of the districts I used to work at had its own assistive technology team, where whenever you had questions, they came out kind of as that expert model to work with the team and said, here's all of the tools we can have to try, here's access to all of the different programs, we'll help you evaluate, and then they would come check back in on implementation to see what's working. And I think that's such a great resource for teams. And I think a lot of school districts are missing that. Hey, um, can you guys hear me? This is Heather. Hi, Heather. Um, hey, <laughs> I'm on my phone. I just got home um, and I didn't know how well it was working. Um, okay, I have a question about, um, you, you talked about assessment, the assessment piece kind of in the context of an IEP, but I'm also thinking about it in the context of an ETR. I know that, for example, some of my ISs might give um, kids um, text to speech stuff sort of informally um, or vice versa, speech to text sort of informally. Um, and what I guess I'm thinking about the planning of it, uh, of the eval. At what point do I say, hey, you know what, we really need to do an assistive tech eval? I think we don't really know that yet with the districts. And this is one of those that I would love to be more involved in kind of making that plan from the beginning of the year and maybe giving them more resources. Like if DES could offer an assistive technology team that helps with those assessments and maybe mm -hmm. looking at some of the discipline specific, because I would say that if you have a student that you know really has those significant speech and language um, concerns that they're looking at augmentative communication. I would think that SLP would probably want to be the one who really looks at that and would want to do specific assessments related to that area. Or as an OT, I don't typically do formalized assessments, but I do a lot of informal type things where I demonstrate the activities for the student as well as take that data about how long or how difficult it is for them to do the tasks with handwriting. And then mm -hmm. I recommend it. But there are a lot of tools that we can maybe look at implementing more that are specific measurable tools and measuring that difference with assistive technology that we could add into the ETRs as it is a space on the ETR that you can click as an area of assessment that we probably yeah, exactly. need to do in more detail. Mm -hmm. Okay. So sort of there's not a whole lot of guidance right now about that. So kind of go with my gut <laughs> or ask Jessica. <laughs> I would say go with your gut and go with your resources on your team. But I okay. think that's something that we can maybe in the future keep developing more so that we do have a more standardized protocol of if you know you need very specific assistive technology assessment that we can make sure all that information is done as part of the ETR so it can be well documented in the IEP. Okay, thanks for that. Does anybody else have any other questions? Okay, well, Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question. 
I've been driving this whole time and listening pretty intently. Um, so I know that you guys already said that you would have the PowerPoint you were going to work on trying to have that available to us after this is over. Um, I had just put my email address in the chat for that if that's the way that we're going to do that. And I see the link on there. Is that how we go for the CEUs? Yes, that, there's, yeah, when you click the link, there's also going to be a, that's the evaluation page, and then there's going to be a link on the evaluation page that'll take you to um, record your, for the CEUs. Okay. okay. All right. I just, thank you. Oh, no problem. Thank you. All right. This was wonderful, by the way. Thank you. And Julie, if there's anything I can do to help get the PowerPoint easily accessible or at least some of the resources page, just let me know and I can help find a way to get that sent out to everybody too. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have any other questions for Jessica? Well, thank you everybody. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you for coming today. Make sure you click that link that's in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you all so much and if anybody has any other questions please feel free to reach out to me i'm happy to help in any way that i can <laughs>